Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today we are joined by Municipality of Lakeshore Councillor Kelsey Santa Rosa. Lakeshore, Ontario is a picturesque municipality nestled along the scenic shores of Lake St. Clair, boasting a unique blend of natural beauty and thriving community life. The landscape of Lakeshore is characterized by its expansive waterfront, lush green spaces, and well-maintained parks. Residents and visitors alike can enjoy the scenic ambiance of Lake St. Clair with opportunities for boating, fishing, and leisurely walks along the waterfront trails. Lakeshore's community spirit is evident in its welcoming neighborhoods where a diverse population contributes to a rich tapestry of culture. Whether one is drawn to the waterfront charm or the commitment of preserving nature, Lakeshore, Ontario stands as a testament to the harmonious coexistence of modern living and natural beauty. It's a place where residents proudly call home and visitors find solace in the tranquility of its surrounding. This is Cross Border Interviews with Councillor Kelsey Santa Rosa. Kelsey, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start, as I always do on this show, in getting to know the person behind the counselor persona. And I want to start the line of questioning with the age-old question on this show, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Kelsey? I This one, I think, like most elected officials, I will say it comes from family. So I'll back up and say thanks so much for having me. This is great <laughs> to start the conversation, but um, it comes from family. I have a long line of uh, politically interested family members, not necessarily politically involved at the party level, uh, but it's always been a conversation around you know the dinner table. And I have a, on both sides, my family, my mom and my dad, uh, a, a strong entrepreneurial sense on both sides. So coming from you know family businesses, uh, immigrant stories, and and them setting up. Uh, in Windsor, Essex here as well. So it's always been about a sense of one, being able to give back with what you have um, at any point, encouraging me to get involved at a really young age helps because when you see from a young age how your actions can make a difference in your community, it tends to snowball in, in the best way possible from there. So it's, you know, recognize your capacity, give back where you can, understand that it's part of your civic responsibility and be open to having that conversation. So uh, I got started in, in business really young and, you know, started serving on a local uh, youth council when I was just about 15. And so it, it really just kept growing from there. Was it always a municipal interest for yourself or had you, like many other people I've spoken to, particularly in Ontario, always mm -hmm. thought of potentially if you ever get into politics, it's going to be Queen's Park or it's going to be the House of Commons. I'm assuming not a lot of people when I was growing up were talking about, I want to be my local mayor. Were you that sort of oddball and were you looking at municipal politics always or had you considered other levels before finally deciding municipal is where I would potentially want to give back to my community? Yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm one of those outliers that really looked at municipal first. Um, I love you already. It, <laughs> was it the Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> reference? No. Um, so, no, I, I think that's where it really started. So I got lucky. Uh, we have in, in Lakeshore, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little later, uh, we have a wonderful festival called the Sunsplash Festival. It happens every July. Um, and so it's really one of those first opportunities for um, youth in the community to get involved, to get their, you know, volunteer hours. And so I started helping out um, annually with that, with the car show. And then, of course, you get, uh, you know, here's so-and-so that's doing some volunteer work. It happened to be a colleague of my mom's uh, son who was on the youth council for the Town of Lake Shorts time who said, you know, why don't you just come by to a meeting, see if it's something that you like. You can kind of get a sense as to some of the issues that we're talking about around the table. And if you want to join, you can join. So, okay, got dropped off. You know, this is 2008, going back some time now. And at the time, they were talking about uh, transit issues for us as, uh, as county residents and students and being able to talk about some of the delegations they were doing with our counterparts in the city. Uh, again, focusing on some volunteering and talking about how to increase uh, events across the community for youth in general. And so um, I was appointed at the end of the meeting as a member <laughs> and I never looked back. It is, uh, I think still to this day, I was a member of that committee for eight years. It's the longest uh, relationship I've had with any organization. 
Um, and so you can imagine small town, I was about 15, I was volunteering for our local BIA who supported that festival. And so I was going in and out of town fall for that and for the youth council purpose for eight years before I even thought about uh, running for, for politics. So it, that is where my heart is, is truly tied to our local municipal office. Um, and then I think it, it shifts, you know, um, I started paying more attention, I think, to, to provincial government and to federal government as you get a little bit older and you realize, okay, you know, these, this, my student costs as a university student are going to cost me a bit, you know, how, it, how are the decisions that they're making at the provincial level going to affect me there and just changes your awareness level. But there's always been something drawing me back to, to the municipal level. And if you'd ask me today, I have I have no intention of, of seeking any party politics uh, participation anytime soon. I, I really love where I'm at. So what happened in 2018, if you don't mind me asking and poking the bear a little bit, because you have to finally say, OK, now is the time to put up or shut up. But I looked at your resume. I looked at I did a deep dive on you. You are a busy person. Mm -hmm. And municipal politics, on top of being a busy person, makes for just no private life at all. What was going on in 2018 that you said, OK, Kelsey, it's time to put your name on the ballot and put your name forward because this is the election that you think you can make the biggest difference? Well, thanks. So, uh, yes, I, I was very busy at the time. I think I was finding myself I had like a lot of um uh, like a lot of young Ontarians, a lot of young Canadians, I'd left for a little bit uh, to Mississauga, to the big city, to do a little bit of a certificate after I graduated uh, from the University of Windsor. I came back, and for the first time in my life, I wasn't in school, I wasn't working. Uh, my friends had all moved out to uh, to British Columbia, which is the tough one for me, and I thought, okay, if I'm about to set down some roots, I think I should probably do it right um, and I, I have to give a huge shout out to some of our former members of council um, and current members of council who were really the ones that pushed me. So it was back in the 2014 election, if you can believe it, that somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, I'd really like you to consider running. And I went, I won't even be 21. Not yet. Let me get through school. Um, and that was a huge vote of confidence even back then. Um, but it really gave me those four years to start thinking about, wow, okay, people see me in that space. That's wonderful. And so then leading into 2018, um, there was somebody who I knew was going to be seeking re-election. And I said, would you like some help with your campaign? And they went, no, I want you to run your own. And I went, okay, I guess I'm going to do it then. And uh, that was kind of where we had ended up. So at, at 20, in 2018, um, I was 24, thereabouts, 24 years old when the call for nominations opened. Um, I'd been a business owner alongside my sister for four years, university graduate, um, and I was working uh, as a language assessor, so working predominantly with newcomers to the country um, and trying to get them connected to to support, especially in language training. So it, uh, yeah, it was one, the timing was right. I'd been pushed by the right people who I deeply, deeply respected, uh, who saw that potential in me. And it seemed like the the right fit. So I can, I can imagine when you first put, decided to put your name on the ballot in 2018, you didn't expect all the challenges that the, not only the municipality, but the entire country, the entire world would be going through. Global pandemic in 2020, so two years into your first term, mm -hmm. everything shuts down. Out of that now, thank God, and we're now into an economic downturn. So you are in sort of a weird, tough moment in municipal life. Looking back on it, would you have gone into it knowing what you know now? A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Um, because I think I've come at it with a true sense of curiosity. So I've been able to weather the storm a bit differently um, because I'm recognizing that this was net new. You know, I was in, in 2018, we had three new counselors that joined the ranks. This in 2022, we had half of our council turnover. So we have four new members. Uh, which is or, or in shifts, I should say, um, from how that how that's gone. So four net new members, new person sitting in the the mayor's seat and in the deputy mayor's seat. So it doesn't matter if it's a pandemic, a new election, uh, you know, infrastructure funding problems. There will always be something that comes forward at the council table. Um, I regret that 
it didn't provide us as many opportunities to sit down in person and talk about some of those big issues. I think in municipal politics, the benefit that we do have is that you can come from any political stripe, any background that you choose, and it's incumbent upon us to, to sit down and really drive and find consensus amongst each other. Um, but I won't say that it made me a worse counselor. I was really thrilled to be online in a bit of a digital world uh, so that I could have my laptop open in front of me. And I was really good. I'm really, really great at doing the research side of, let me pull up that previous decision or what we said about that so that I can make sure I'm speaking you know, facts in, in the council meeting. And so having technology on my side at that point helped. Uh, we're now fortunate in this new term to be working on iPads, so I get to do that at the council table, and I've maintained that piece. Um, but I, I would go into it definitely, again, regardless of, of walking through a pandemic. I think having some positive energy, some curiosity was probably a huge support to our staff, too, as they were navigating the, the complexities of, of 2020 and beyond. You, you've had to make some very tough decisions around that council table, I'm assuming, with budgets, with the pandemic, with uh, the, especially in the budget season we're in right now. Um, how do you go into those meetings every single time, knowing that you have to make decisions that are going to impact your neighbors, your family members, the people that you call friends, and do it in a way that you are not impacting their day-to-day -day lives as in, impactful as you might need to, because let's be honest, municipalities don't have a lot of money. And if you don't raise taxes, therefore service levels and infrastructure projects aren't going to get done. So how do you go into that council meeting, ensuring that what you're doing is going to make the biggest impact, but not the biggest impact at the same time? That's a great question. And I think we're really sitting with that right now. So I'm about to head into budget deliberations. We actually just had our budget presentation at council yesterday. So that was just the opportunity for our CFO to be able to present that information. You know, it's now available to the public and the emails are coming in already because we've <laughs> got about a blended rate sitting just under 6%, including our upper tier and the education rate. And so but at the same time, for us, where we are in, in Lakeshore, looking at our comparator municipalities under the County of Essex and the City of Windsor, we still have the lowest tax rate. And we have technically the most affordable municipality in the region because our development has led to a lot of high income earners also settling in the municipality. So I recognize that, that piece there. I think transparency is the best way that we can approach that situation because we're seeing now and we saw in the last term and definitely now how little had been put away in our reserves to support the infrastructure needs to accommodate how quickly we grew. And that's something that I think a lot of people, you know, might gloss over over the, the pandemic period. I mean, I'm a millennial that was looking for a home during the pandemic mm -hmm. and, and that housing crisis uh, that continues. But Lakeshore, between the last census and the, and the previous, grew 10.4%. And the bulk of that was in specific parts of the municipality and our more urban corridors. So it's put some significant pressure on the, the infrastructure that we have. And so we've seen this wonderful residential growth. And now we're focusing on the commercial side of things. So again, I think you have to tie it back to, first of all, what you're hearing at the doors, what people are saying online and tapping into that and making sure that you have your ear to the ground to understand how the decisions you're making are actually tied to the ultimate wants and goals that the community themselves are asking for. Um, and then to making sure that it's a fair decision, an incremental decision, if it has to be one, if you're you're taking steps in the right direction um, to put us in line with some of our, our counterparts. So it's, it's not an easy answer. It's be everywhere all the time at once to hear as much information as you can. Um, but then also giving yourself some grace to understand that you are not making this decision alone. It's a collective decision and you have to be willing to listen to the lived experience of the counselors that sit around the table and the people that come to delegate in front of us. So is, is it hard to balance that aspect of the job? Because I can imagine because you are elected as a ward three counselor, you are elected mm -hmm. for ward three, but when you are sworn in, you're not sworn in as ward three counselor for the Ooh. municipality of Lakeshore. You are sworn in as municipality of Lakeshore counselor. So you have to balance what your residents want with what the community wants and sometimes they may differ because what you hear in Ward 3 may be different than what you hear at Ward 2 or Ward 1. How do you see your role in balancing what the people who've elected you with the realities mm -hmm. of what the community needs to do to grow? 
a lot of conversation. Um, I will, this is, so it's interesting. Does it get easier? Does it get easier? I, I don't yep. know if it gets easier. I think it's um, to navigate maybe, or to know what you might be coming up against, you have the benefit of some experience, I think for sure. Um, we've dealt with, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, we're one of those communities that experienced amalgamation uh, back in the late 90s. I am not old enough to remember amalgamation. I am 30. So that puts me in an interesting situation because I have to believe what I'm hearing from residents and how they are feeling about what's going on in each part of our municipality. We have a number of communities with unique histories that weathered amalgamation differently, have different feelings about how they are represented at the council table and whether or not that's equitable and fair. And it's not enough to, you can't dismiss those things. That is how the community is feeling. And so, taking those really thoughtful moments to express and be transparent about why we're making the decisions we are, even if it is, say, a reduction in service, is because, again, we're trying to tie it back to a broader goal. And so it's I, we're in a couple of, of difficult situations right now. I can't say that we don't have work to do in that space as a council um, to make sure that each community is represented, again, given the limited dollars that we have every year um, to spread that investment equally, while also recognizing there are parts of our municipality that cannot grow because of infrastructure um, and uh, and need a little bit of that extra love. So how do you engage with people? Because I have heard through through my countless conversations with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast that there is a apathy when it comes to municipal government. Unless your water doesn't turn on and you're joking, for those who are listening, you're kind of chuckling at that statement. Yeah. But the average resident probably would not tell, be able to tell me what's going on at their local council level, no. council meeting on a weekly basis or even on a monthly basis for some municipalities. How do you engage with a community that, and to, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the municipality of Lakeshore does actually engage. Maybe they want to talk about the council issues. How do you engage on issues to make sure that you're getting the pulse of what the community wants? So that's an ongoing piece. So first and foremost, I am lucky enough, I want to just start with my employment. So I work in local workforce and community development. And so I bring probably a more regional perspective to our local council table than some might offer. I'm very closely linked to our local um, our local board, our local, what was previously uh, or under our workforce development board, our local immigration partnership. I'm also supporting the transformation of Employment Ontario services across the community. So first and foremost, I love data. So I am looking at who's accessing which services, uh, how we're capturing data as a municipality, how we're mapping that, how it's supporting our internal program de uh, development and delivery so that we can take a look at that. Love data. Um, the second part of that is related to my community connections as well. So not just through work, but personally, I really, really prioritize having strong community connections with community service providers, other nonprofit organizations that are actually meeting the needs of our community um, beyond the municipal service level. Third piece, of course, is staying involved as much as I can in the community. So by you can't just become a municipal counselor and pull out of all your volunteering responsibilities and call that a day. So I do sit and continue to sit on several boards. I'm still the parade marshal for Sunsplash, and I have been for 13 years, um, despite our pandemic, uh, our, our pandemic blips there. So it's it's that. And then making sure that you're reachable so that one, you know, when I was going out and doing door to door, I personally tried to make an attempt to get to every single door within the municipality or at least get my contact information out there, making sure that I'm following uh, some of those social media and Facebook groups as much as they can be a, a space for venting. Um, it's a great place to sit down and read and see what the issues are there, as long as you're taking everything with a grain of salt, because sometimes it becomes a bit of an echo chamber. Um, but it's, yeah, and, and constantly looking for those new kind of sources of truth and information, and then sitting down with my counselor colleagues too, and, and hearing from them directly what residents are calling them with so that I can better understand that perspective, because I can't can't represent what I'm not hearing. That's true. Um, I want to turn to segment two for a second because I'm cautious of time and I want to talk about the municipality as a whole. 
As I always do on this show, prior to talking about segment two, I always preamble it with, this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not even a policy of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion and her opinion alone. I don't know why, but in 2024, 190 episodes later, we still get emails, but here we are. (laughs) Counselor, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the municipality today as of recording this? Um, Land use planning and infrastructure, uh, the cost of infrastructure. So I I say that for many reasons. Uh, Lakeshore, over the past couple of years, we actually had to put uh, a stop to new development applications while we got an expansion put together for our sewage treatment facility locally. Um, because, and as I've expressed some of those changes around uh, some of that growth that we had and experienced um, over the the pandemic period, and and really it's been nonstop for us for about 15 years as a municipality, um, we know that that uh, capacity that we've just created is only going to last so long. Um, The other piece that exists there is we've seen obviously with Bill 23 and a lot of the Planning Act changes that are coming down the line, as well as what's going on with the Housing Accelerator Fund and that request for four units per lot. We know that the sewage treatment capacity and the wastewater capacity we have in the municipality will only go so far. Um, And because we are surrounded by water uh, as a peninsula here in southwestern Ontario, and specifically for us, as as our name would suggest, Lake Shore, we are on the shore of Lake St. Clair. Um, along our entire northern border, um, we do experience flooding events as well within the municipality. And so making sure that we have a a handle on inflow and infiltration to protect the systems we have, extend their life, but also extend, uh, you know, the capacity of those services so that we can see and support denser development in the municipality that has traditionally been single detached family homes um, is is really what I'm looking forward to because we won't see the economic investment without it. We won't see increased residential development without it. Um, and so that's where really where we're turning our focus as a, as a municipality and as a council has been on water, wastewater, stormwater, infrastructure, um, including getting on top of, of roads. So I can talk about the planning side for probably ever. It's my biggest passion and interest um, and did a lot of reading on that just before getting elected, actually, out of personal passion. So it helps when your your work's aligned. So can I ask which comes first, the chicken or the egg in this scenario? Because you and I probably will both know, well, I'm assuming we both know that Growth can't come unless infrastructure is there. Infrastructure can't come unless growth is there because if you're not growing, then you're doing it on the backs of the people who are there right now. Mm -hmm. So how do you plan for the future? How do you make these changes to the land use bylaw with the understanding that you're going to have to spend money and that's going to potentially come at the cost at the expense of people who are currently there? And they're possibly going, I can't afford any more. You need to find another source of revenue. You need to find another method to bring development in to Mm -hmm. add these four plexes, to increase the water sewage facilities, because right now we're at our max. How do you do that in a small town or a small municipality? I say small, as in Ontario small, Alberta, you're like a metropolis compared to what some of our (laughs) small towns are. (laughs) Um, okay, so chicken and the egg, I'll go back to that first. I think the reality is, is the growth is here, right? So we're is seeing this, now. Are, you, even, are people coming knocking on your door like every day? I, I mean, I don't know about every day, but the growth is already existing and it's finding creative ways to exist within the municipality. So okay. secondary dwelling units, additional dwelling units, that's an example right there. Because of our capacity, we've not included in our current you know, zoning bylaw, and we're waiting on, a, on an official plan update to come any moment now um, from our upper tier as an approval. Um, but those are pieces where we're struggling to give the actual municipal okay because we don't have the capacity to treat wastewater. But does that mean that somebody hasn't rented out their basement? No, we know that that, that use is existing, it's there. You know, we are a, a college and a university community as well, attached to, you know, St. Clair College, College Barreal, University of Windsor. So we have students that are living in housing out in our municipality as well and commuting in. So 
the reality is, is the growth is there and we do have the interest from the development community to see some more um, what we would call mid mid rise in our community. So about four to six stories of, of purpose built rentals. So the, the want is there. I think what we've had to focus on alongside our county government is making sure that we focus that growth in a really specific way. And I could not be more proud of, of this council and taking a step and having some really strong conversations about the importance of infill and up, not out, as we're talking about our, our urban areas. We Do just, you have a lot uh, of pushback on that? Just on that uh, that analogy alone, up and not out, right? Because mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of people who are like, I love my neighborhood that only has two-story houses and that's it. And I don't want a fourplex or four-story apartment building in my neighborhood. Do you have the NIMBYism alive and well in Lakeshore? A hundred percent we do. And unfortunately, it may be the hill I die on, um, but I'm willing. So it's... <laughs> You, we, there has to be a group of us, right? And and that's the reality. I think the frustration that we're seeing and, and in Southwestern Ontario, we have a lot of migration coming from other parts of Toronto and around the GTA as costs of living increase um, in metropolis uh, or metropolitan communities. And so as folks are moving down, they're expecting the level of service as well that exists in some of those more urban, urban communities. And we don't have transit in Lakeshore because we do not have the density to support that service. And so without the density, the service doesn't come. So we have no choice when you talk chicken or the egg, you know, in this case, the intensity in residential development has to come to support those future pieces. So again, you have to tie it back to, it may not be this community right now that's, you know, really hurting for transit because you moved out to a rural community and knew what you were getting yourselves into, but it does not mean that the next generation or your kids won't be looking for that service or utilize it either. And so I think even going back to some of your earlier questioning around how do you balance that, it's am I doing a job to serve only the people that showed up on election day and voted and are engaged, or am I doing a job to support a community that may not be as engaged in municipal politics that should still see some representation in the decisions we're making? So on the flip side of that, though, and I, I always ask this question because I think it's an important one that a lot of municipalities, municipal councillors and politicians have to struggle with is how do you do, because you just talked about two very big macro issues in your community, but I guarantee you if I go talk to 100 people in Lakeshore, heck, if I talk to 10 people in Ward 3 of the municipality of Lakeshore, I will hear 100 different answers about what the biggest issue in your community is. They may talk parks, they may talk service levels, they may talk this, that, or the other. How do you balance the needs and wants of your community with the needs and wants of the individual? And I'm going back to that age old question for anyone who listens to the show, you know, I'm a Trekkie. I quote Spock all the time from Rathacon, how do the, the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. So in your yeah. instance, how do you say no to someone knowing that some issues cannot be solved because you have, do not have the financial uh, ability to pay for all the things that people want, but in the reality that you need to move forward as a community and address all issues so that way they feel like their issues are being addressed when it comes to paying property taxes. So maybe I'll respond with an example because I just had one actually that came through the other day. So maybe this I love examples. is a really Let's recent do it. one, so maybe not the best example, but I'll give it anyway. Um, so I had a resident that reached out. Um, we just had, of course, we're in the middle of winter, tons of, uh, of ice and snow build up. Uh, there was one day, actually, I think within my own ward, we had somebody that was out in their hockey skates skating on the roadway because we had such a bad freezing rain. Now, we have a lot of cul-de-sacs as well in the municipality, and so there are situations where you're not supposed to park in specific areas, but we know that on-street parking is becoming more prevalent because you have more kids staying home, there's more people living in homes than there used to be, that's just the way things are going. And so this person had requested, well, why can't we update our parking bylaw, or why can't we update our yard maintenance bylaw, or whatever it's going to be to make sure that people are pulling their cars off the road during storm events for snow clearing, well, the difficulty is, is even if we did have that change, I don't have bylaw working past 430 and they're not working on weekends. So I can change and I can have my staff do that. But until us as a, we as a council choose to invest in additional staff and work with our unions or whatever that's going to look like to extend the actual staff capacity, that bylaw change is kind of moot. It doesn't, it's not going to support much. 
Well, and then on the top of that as well, you, if they work past the hours, that means you're going to have to pay them more. And then therefore your taxes are going to go <laughs> increase. So exactly. where would you like to, anyway. So, so, and that's it right there, right? I think I, I have some innate ability, I think, to really see the macro picture, but also understand where people are coming from. And so I always try to tie it back to what can I actively do and really be honest with myself in that moment? Am I willing personally to make this decision or to go out on a limb and ask this of our of our staff? Do I think it is an appropriate use of staff time to explore this issue first and foremost? And do I think I'm going to have council support at the end of the day to push through a decision that will need to be made in support of this? So I'm asking myself a ton of questions before I even respond to the resident to make sure that I'm giving them a really honest answer. And so in this case, what I was able to say is you have all of these mechanisms available if you're noticing that this problem is persisting. I can continue to see to it that we invest and continue to invest in this bylaw department and our ability to respond to you. Let's go through that enforcement mechanism, knowing that we have these rules in place, and then we can work um, on, on any next steps if we see them. But it's and it's being honest that it's potentially going to be a slow process, you know, to say to somebody, you're never going to see a car parked out in front of your home ever again, not going to happen. I can't make that promise. And so, um, you know, usually the honesty piece, the this is what I'm doing or can do in this moment. And this is what we might want to look to in the future. Um, and, and laying it out, I think that way has been a really successful strategy for me. Now, I've been accused on this show that of only talking about negative things when it comes to the second segment. So I have to sort of kind of flip the script a little bit and say, what do you boast about when you talk about the municipality of Lakeshore? What is the thing? And I and I, I want to I want to focus for a second here by saying, what do you boast about from an administrative government side? We're going to talk about like some of the great things in the tourism section, but right now. When you go talk to people at Roma, when you go talk to people at AMO, what do you boast about when it comes to your community? I boast about the fact that we have a wonderful mix of really passionate, involved staff. So it's been really neat to have been involved in municipal uh, in municipal government and municipal politics um, from the age of, say, 15 on, because what I've noticed is, you know, those friendly faces that were there to greet you at the front door and, and the, you know, the administrative team that we had as a municipality of 26,000 people. We have some of those wonderful faces that have stayed with us, um, some that have gone on to represent other municipalities and have done us proud. Um, and then we have this wonderful new influx of talent that's coming into the municipality as well that's seeing to some of that technical innovation that we're seeing other in GIS mapping, uh, in the way that we report different things. And so it's that that wonderful multi-generational mix that we have within our municipality, that desire to do right by our residents um, and, and to continue learning through the work, I think has been the best part. We have some phenomenal people that work for the municipality of Lakeshore. And I to be honest, it, it's one of the better parts of the job. I I could see myself on the other side of the desk before I would see myself in party politics, to be honest with you, um, because I have such an appreciation for the work that they do. So, As a former administration staff for a municipality, I just want to say thank you for saying that the administration staff for any municipality is great. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time and I know you're a busy counselor. So I want to talk about my favorite subject and that is tourism. I love tourism. I think tourism is great. I have made a pledge on this show. If you come on the show, I come to your community. So I will be in Lakeshore later in 2024. I was supposed to be in that neck of the woods last year, but a detour had me come back to Calgary after being on the road for a week and a half. So I made my pledge 2024 Southwestern Ontario. I will be there. So oh, when I'm there, leave. besides grabbing a coffee with you, what are some of the tourist destinations? What are some of the hidden gems that you would say to any tourist coming to your community, you need to see this? Okay. Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> I'm a huge foodie, so I guess I could start on that front. Um, yeah, so let's start, let's start with food. Okay. Uh, municipality of Lakeshore, I mean, we are seeing, we have a wonderful Francophone and French community out in Pointe de Roche. Um, and other parts of uh, the municipality as well. But um, so one of our, our local Francophones and, and his wife, they have the Iron Kettle. They're an award-winning 
um, pair and duo that started off as a bed and breakfast and have now opened up uh, their commissary out in Comber. So they have been notorious for putting the small community of Comber on the map and we're very fortunate to have them. So that's where the coffee and the pastries is going to come in. Uh, we're gonna do a little stop in Ward 3 to hit up the Punjabi Bazaar because we have a wonderful uh, Punjabi community here in Lakeshore that knows how to cook, my goodness. Um, so we can do that for food. And then if you're still hungry after that, I would say you're probably gonna have to go fresh perch or pickerel either out of Lake St. Clair, which we front, or Lake Erie to our south, we can hit up a neighbor for that. Um, but as far as tourism goes, I mean, Lakeshore, first and foremost, because we're a waterfront community, we've got a lot of folks that come in for Sunsplash and for um, our car show on Friday, not just from all over Ontario, but we get folks that come in from the US as well for that. Um, in previous years, we've also been able to host the Can-Am um, jet ski races as well, which has brought in folks from all over the Caribbean and North America, which has just been phenomenal. You can get out and do some really good musky fishing out on Lake St. Clair as well. Um, not even to mention all of the things that we can get into on the sports side. The history side, though, I think is uh, another piece that we have um, that we do really well in Lakeshore with a couple of small uh, museums that are run. So we have uh, the Comber and the Maidstone Museum, but we also have the Walls Freedom uh, Historic Freedom Site, and that was one of the stop, last stops on the Underground Railroad. And so that site is still maintained. Uh, Rosa Parks had actually paid visit uh, to the Walls Historic Site once upon a time. And so I would always, um, if you're coming in to learn, eat and do things, uh, that is a stop I would suggest you schedule and make time for. And that is uh, within Pews. Well, I am now more than ever looking forward to visiting the municipality of Lakeshore because that is a, just a, as a historian, as someone who likes history, it's just a wet dream for me to talk about things like that. And I, I know that's weird, but that's just, it is an amazing uh, a moment. I, I'm looking forward to visiting Lakeshore. That's Wonderful. all I can say. Um <laughs> I want to ask you sort of a Sophie's Choice question here for a second. No. And I'm going to say, where do you go to, in your community to decompress? After a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work, where, where's your go-to place? Oh, am I supposed to give this away? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can be like every other counselor and say it's my home and I like to just go be an introvert and stay at home for the rest of my life. <laughs> That has its place. I think we can assume that that's the, the piece. I live two blocks from Town Hall, though, so I uh, I get the benefit of being able to walk just about anywhere. Um, for me, it's definitely Lakeview Park and the marina. So um, Lakeview Park, the beach part is right on the other side of the Belt River, so it's in Ward 3, the other's in Ward 4. Um, but we have a beautiful marina, and that parking lot and that view of Lake St. Clair, we have some of the best if not the best sunsets during the summer, they're absolutely phenomenal. So park in the car, going for a walk, sitting down on a bench or going to grab an ice cream down at the beach. Uh, shout out to A&J's Snack Shack, which was where we had originally opened a, a business, my sister and I. So I have a lot of fond memories being at the, at the beach and being able to take in those sunsets and sunrises. So I, I have to say that that's where I wanna be is outside taking in the view. Now, I, I know I'm cautious of time here, so hopefully I have an extra oh, two, two, three minutes for me, because you mentioned something at the top of the show, and I thought you would go into a little bit more detail later on in the tourism section, but you kind of didn't. So I'm going to kind of poke the bear a little bit and say, what the heck is Sunsplash? And why is it? Why are you the parade marshal for a parade 13 years in a row? <laughs> because it's too fun. I can't let it go, Chris. Uh, no, I figured I talked about it quite a bit. So uh, for those that are interested, it's usually the third week in July. So I'm looking forward to uh, to welcoming folks back to Bell River. Um, it's hosted by our Bell River on the Lake BIA. And so it'll kick off likely Thursday, the 11th uh, this year and go through all the way till the 14th. Um, it is a fabulous weekend. So we always kick off with uh, you know, everything from live music and, you know, kids singing competitions to the car show that lines all of Main Street with vendors and, and everything with a market and a little bit of a fair down by the river as well. Um, like I said, we've had 
everything from the parade to jet ski races to um, at one point, one of the, the highlights was the South, Southern Ontario Lawn Tractor Association's races, the lawnmower races, uh, which were just a really great time. So I think there are a ton of folks that just look forward to the weekend. It's a great chance to get out with the family. Most of it's free. So you can always do something and, and keep a little busy just by walking through town and, and checking out the local shops and businesses. So I look forward to it every year. I think my family now, I've roped them in so many years and my friends as volunteers that they look forward to it. Um, so I, I can't encourage anybody enough to come out and check it out. Um, well, I will be in Ontario in July because I'll be back visiting my family during that month. So maybe I'm going to try and make sure that I'm there from the 11th to the 14th down in Lakeshore. Um, That'd be great. So my last question before I let you go here, and it's the million dollar question. We started the show talking about you. We're going to end talking about the, the municipality of Lakeshore. In your opinion, counselor, what makes the municipality of Lakeshore such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? Okay, I'm going to give the really cheesy answer first, which is the people, and then I might expand on that. Because I think that's what this all comes down to, right? Is if you've got the right mix of people making decisions for a community, then you have faith in what's to come beyond what currently exists. Now, if we're talking about what currently exists as a municipality, I am so, so happy that I was, first of all, raised in Lakeshore, get to uh, live in and work on the off chance that I'm working from home. Um, but we're part of a wonderful region, which is Windsor-Essex. And so we've got the benefit of being right there at a border community, being able to hop over and head to Detroit and, and take advantage of everything that Detroit and Michigan have to offer across the border. We get to come back to our, our quiet municipality that continues to grow. We have wonderful recreation programs uh, that make it really easy to put your kids in sports or arts or to get them outside and walking around and moving. And we've got ready access to the waterfront. And so if you're if you're someone that loves to get out on the water, whether it's on a paddle board, whether you're windsurfing or kite surfing, or you've got a pontoon boat you like to hang out on the summer, it is a phenomenal place to be. And I think giving that access has been wonderful. And as far as work goes, I mean, again, we have so many wonderful industries in Lakeshore, not just on the manufacturing side of things, but also on the service and the social side of things. Um, that touch and, and continue to build on what our region does really, really well. And so the opportunities are kind of endless when you look to our neighbors to the south that do an absolutely phenomenal job in, in agriculture. We have manufacturing, which is uh, really, really heavy, and Lakeshore offers quite a bit under the logistics sector as well. So it's and we're in a university community. I mean, you, there's really no going wrong from start to finish. You've got a ton of opportunities. So oh. I just unplugged my the headset there for a second. Sorry about that. Um, counselor, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking 45 minutes out of your busy schedule to do this interview today. But I also want to take a moment and say thank you for serving your community. Um, in my interviews from across Canada, I'm learning so much about these great municipalities that people represent, but I'm learning about the passion. And in our brief conversation, because I feel like we could go on for another four hours, um, it truly feels like you have a passion for your community and has a passion for your uh, municipality moving forward. So thank you for serving and thank you for being a voice on council that your probably council is in need of because, well, they've elected you twice. So thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Thank you again, Councillor, for sitting down with us and chatting about the municipality of Lakeshore. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all of our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches of local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.